We are here in our third week on this uh, proverbial mini-series of an introduction to the Trinity. The first week, for those who weren't there, just to recap, was a kind of bird's eye view, a macroscopic outline of some of the fundamental principles of Trinitarian theology. We examined a series of select passages that look primarily at one, the fact that God is indeed one. We looked at the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. But then we examined what it means for this one God to indeed exist as a trinity. And we saw that the persons, the three persons of the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are co-equal and co-eternal with each other. We also saw that they are indeed persons by virtue of the fact that they are able to love and to give grace and to fellowship with each other and with us, and that they are not just simply different modes or proverbial masks and faces of God by virtue of the fact of their appearing at the baptism of Jesus simultaneously. Last week we were examining the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, and we examined what that means for him to title himself as Father, and examining that it is not a matter of genetic relationship to the Son or to us as people, but rather it is a relational title, especially as we saw first week that the three persons of the Trinity are co-equal and co-eternal. They are not higher and lower in their nature or their substance. And so these titles naturally therefore refer to a relational status, not a genetic or a natural one. Today, we will be examining the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Now, as gigantic of an area of theology of a subject that is Trinitarian theology, equally so is that of Christology, who Jesus is, and what he has and continues to do. The nature and person and work of Christ is a monumental subject that theologians spend their entire lives examining and barely reach the foothills of true knowledge thereof. So how on earth are we going to possibly address this subject in one sermon? Fortunately for you, I have done the work necessary to cull away and condense down to an infinitely small containment exactly what we will be looking at this morning. We will be focusing as really is the essence of this mini-series which leads into our series on the attributes of God. We are simply focusing on the who or the what, not necessarily all the various things that God does. Those characteristics and those actions, that's the Attributes of God series. Here we are focusing on substance, on nature. Who is God? In this case, today, who is the second person of the Trinity? As I was working on trying to formulate how to piece this together into just one sermon, I was reminded of a letter I read one time from Sir Winston Churchill. And in brevity, he was writing to a friend. And the letter went for 22 pages in classic Winston Churchill style. And therein he he apologised to his friend, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I apologise, dear friend, for for writing such a long letter. I didn't have enough time to write a shorter one. (laughs) Because it's often easier to just simply expound and keep expounding and going on and on and on and on than it is to actually condense down into a finite totality that is actually explainable. What we are primarily focusing on, you will recall that we've had a series of passages read, um, famous ones, especially pertaining to Christology, like the prologue of John's Gospel, those first 18 verses. And then we've had, just before this, read to us Colossians chapter 2 in the opening nine verses. That was primarily for context, because in reality, we're actually just simply going to be focusing on one verse, namely that of verse 9. But what we will do is give some context, as was the purpose of actually reading that broader uh, passage, and our exegesis will focus almost almost exclusively on just verse 9, which is 
not just one of the seminal verses on the person of Christ, but it is one of the single most important verses when it comes to understanding Christology, when it comes to understanding the person and work of Jesus Christ. So, let us pick up specifically in verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Now, this statement could also be encapsulated as to say empty, deceitful philosophy. It's not necessarily trying to make a distinguishment that philosophy is inherently by default bad. It is talking specifically in an adjectival form about empty, vain, deceptive, deceitful, wicked philosophy. Philosophy, after all, is the study of wisdom. We are admonished ad infinitum and throughout the scriptures, are we not to gain and grow in our knowledge of the Lord and subsequently grow in wisdom? We, of course, have many books throughout the Old Testament which are categorized as wisdom literature. Here, Paul is referencing vain, empty, void, vacuous, meaningless, deceitful, deceptive philosophy, which abounded and surrounded the people of God, especially in these days, not just from external Greek sources, but also indeed from the Gnostic cult, who claimed to be Christian. And the various heretical groups, which even by the point of Paul's letter to the Church of Colossae, had begun to spring up, particularly in the eastern portions, the Greek-speaking portions, of the Roman Empire. So Paul here is exhorting the people at Colossae to not be taken captive, to not be enslaved by empty, deceitful philosophy. That should cause our is to raise up our antennas to shoot off and go, okay, he must be talking about something pretty important here. So let's continue. He gives the categorizations too particularly of what is constituting the empty, deceitful philosophy that he has in view here, namely that it is according to human tradition and according to the elemental spirits or elemental principles or principalities of the world and not according to Christ. Okay. These are used in parallel. They're used both as separate categories and also in tandem. Right? So by human tradition, meaning not biblical tradition, godly tradition, right? right tradition, it's talking about worldly, human, purely man-made tradition. Okay? Especially when it pertains to these philosophies and ideas and worldviews. And that is then itself related to philosophies void and vacuous, that are according to the elemental principles or elemental principalities, elemental spirits of the world. It's a phrase that Paul uses on multiple occasions. We've examined it before, but nevertheless, it's referring to the powers of darkness that operated in the ancient world, right? in particular. Right? It's not that they don't exist anymore. It's just simply in terms of the elemental principles referring to powers and principalities that controlled the nations that controlled all the nations around Israel, right, around the kingdom. So again, according to human tradition, you can see the link that's being provided, especially under this umbrella admonition against empty, deceitful philosophy that is not of Christ as he finishes with verse 8. Then comes verse 9. For in him, referring to Christ, who we just referred to in the sentence before, For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So here, he is pointing to what the true philosophy is, what the right view is, what one should come to know and order their life around. Not empty, void, vacuous, deceitful, deceptive, dark, philosophy that is of man of the world instead it is of Christ and this is what that is namely that for in him the whole fullness or all the fullness of deity dwells bodily now even on the surface that might seem like a fairly at least relatively speaking simple sentence 
especially because it's in the flow of what then continues on. There's not even a full stop there. Paul does continue that thought through, through verse 10, about being filled with him, that he is the head of all rule and authority. Right? And he then moves into an explanation of the purpose of what circumcision was, as well as how that relates to baptism, and goes into a further exposition of this concept. But verse 9 itself in particular is of paramount importance to understanding the nature of Christ, who he is. And that's why we're going to be exegeting and examining it this morning, especially because it's in the context of Paul giving a warning not to be taken off, to be enslaved by deceptive, false philosophies and worldviews. Okay? There are a number of really, really important words here that fortunately come across to us pretty well in English, uh, very well actually in certain cases, but they're really important for us to understand because they speak to these kinds of concepts that we're examining. They speak to the substance of who Christ is and has been proclaimed to be from the very inception of the New Testament itself. It stands as the foundation, as the bedrock upon which the church has been built, upon which orthodoxy, lowercase o, has been built, upon which the, the righteous doctrine has been built. Because we have seen, have we not, especially in the first few centuries of the church, but also continuing down throughout the millennia, and even to this day, the almost infinite list of heresies and heretical cults that have sprung forth, majority of which are pertaining to the nature of Christ. Not exclusively, but overwhelmingly. All the major early heretical cults and the major heresies that gained a lot of ground in the early days, names which I know some of you are familiar with, right? Arianism, Sabellianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, and I'll explain what some of those are as they relate here. All of them in those contexts were to do with who Jesus is. And people either going one direction or another or doing giant pendulum swings, trying to actually combat heresy and in fact falling into heresy themselves in their attempt to combat heresy. So let's examine some of the particulars here. Let's exegete the meaning out of the text and then we can start to piece together how we are to rightfully understand who the second person of the Trinity is. Okay? For in him, in Christ, all the fullness, your translation might say the whole fullness, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I read one one time that said the totality of fullness. It's not a word you often see in English translations, but it's a brilliant word because that's what it means. <clears throat> it is all the fullness all the fullness dwells. What is it meaning that all the fullness, because again pertaining to deity which comes after, what does it mean that the fullness of this deity is dwelling? It is speaking to the fact that all, that the totality, the completeness of deity, and we'll get onto what that specific word means because that's vital here, it dwells in Christ. Christ is not part God, part man. He is not like many of the Greek heroes of old that the people at Colossae would have been familiar with. He's not like an Achilles or a Hercules who was a man who was then essentially deified to the status of a, of a demigod. He is not part God. He is fully God. And as we'll go on to examine later, fully man. But he is fully God. He is not simply a part, in a divisional sense, of the Trinity. The triune God in his three persons cannot be understood to be a third plus a third plus a third. Does that make sense? It's not like a piece of pie that's been cut up into thirds, where the divinity is somehow split, kind of in portion and in proportionality amongst each other. We are explicitly told in a variety of places, including here, that the persons of the Trinity, and in this specific context, the second person, 
that the fullness of deity, all of it, the totality, the absolute completeness of deity dwells, and it dwells fully. All the fullness of deity dwells bodily. So as we see, all this fullness is pertaining to what? Deity. Now this particular word is fascinating. Interestingly, and I'm going to throw out a term that our Bible study people will be aware of, this is a hapax legomenon. I see some smiling faces because they know what that means. This is an instance where this particular word deity only appears once in all of the Bible, and that's here. Usually when that's the case, again, ears should go up, radar should go off. This is probably important. We should examine what this is trying to communicate if this is the only place in the scriptures in which this word, in this particular form, is used. Because notice that your translations should not say God with a capital G. They will say something to the effect of deity, uh, Godhead, Cover translations rarely say divinity, which would be okay, but doesn't say the fullness of God necessarily as a name, as a title in that sense. It's deity or Godhead or sometimes divinity. And that's not just a kind of quirky translational thing. That's actually imperative to understanding what's going on here. Because what he is doing here, by using the word theotes, divinity, is he is speaking of the substance, the essence, the nature of who God is in his being. It is not just God with a capital G as a kind of title or name. It is the very essence of divinity itself. It's basically what makes God God. Does that make sense? Yeah. It is theotes, deity or divinity. In him, Christ, all the fullness of the essence of deity itself, the nature, the substance of divinity, all of that dwells in him fully. So it is not just simply a reference to him by the title of God, right? Because then you could do what many of the cults throughout history have done, which is simply use it almost in the sense that Jesus is a demigod, he is an elevated being, he is God-like, right? That's what, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses do, okay? To get around their exorbitant list of heresies, they have to inevitably at certain points intentionally and maliciously mistranslate passages. Okay? Because it's blindingly obvious what this is communicating. It's blindingly obvious that it's communicating that Christ is indeed not only fully God, but fully man. So, for example, the New World Translation, which is the proverbial Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses, theirs will say, in him the fullness of godly qualities dwells bodily. Like the characteristics, you see what they're doing there? Oh, it's the divine qualities like grace and mercy and justice and love. Talking about qualities, not nature. Because that's what you have to do to try and justify heresy. You have to purposefully and knowingly mistranslate passages like this one even though we know for a fact from the Greek that that's not on earth what it says. So it's really important for us to understand why Paul chooses to use that word theotes, right, deity. He is speaking to the nature, to the substance, to the essence of this divinity in Christ. And what is this deity doing? What is this godness doing? It is dwelling. Specifically, though, it dwells. It dwells. Notice that your translation does not, hopefully doesn't, your translation does not say dwelt. 
with a T, past tense. Notice that it's in the present tense, dwells. Because that would be saying something entirely different if it did indeed say dwelt, if it was indeed in the past tense. Because here, keep in mind, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae decades after Christ has already ascended, okay? Right? In the middle-ish of the first century. So if he was indeed to say dwelt, past tense, one could then begin to try and infer what again in part the Jehovah's Witnesses have inferred, what many of the Aryan cults have inferred, which is that he was in bodily form, he was human whilst on earth, but no longer is. He was raised spiritually, which is what various heretical cults have believed. So the resurrection wasn't that of body, of glorified body, it was just a spiritual resurrection. And that's where we begin to shoot off into heresy. Okay? We'll explain exactly why that's important. But he is saying present tense dwells. So that means, following along, Paul is saying here, decades after Christ has already ascended, he currently dwells, this deity, in bodily form. He is speaking to the fact, to the reality, that Christ, even in his day as it is now, the fullness of that deity still dwells bodily. Christ is still at the right hand of the Father, ruling over all the world in his body. It was not merely a spiritual resurrection. It was not merely a spiritual ascension. He indeed was raised and ascended in body, in glorified body at that, we're told elsewhere. And he exists still, right this very second, in bodily form. Which is what he's, this is why that addendum comes right at the end. That it dwells bodily. It dwells in the flesh. In the fullness of flesh. And here we have the apostle uniting fullness of deity, fullness of humanity of flesh, in Christ, in him, singular, one person. Why is it important to understand, rightly, that Christ, that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is two natures, fully divine, fully human, united into one person? Not just simply for meaningless, dusty, academic semantics, not merely for the postulations of kind of the theological ivory tower. It's also just not a matter of being nitpicky and correct on a tiny little technical level. That reality that we're being told here makes or breaks our salvation. Getting this verse wrong is the difference between the salvation of God's people actually working, actually being effectual, versus it being an absolute exercise in futility and being completely shattered. Why? We see, and again, this is where I'm having to cap things, we cannot go into a whole stream of verses and passages. What we are told consistently, not just throughout the Old Testament, but also then as expounded and revealed in the New, that indeed it was not just simply, you know, a, a good idea that God had of, ah, here's how I'm going to choose to, to, to save people. Here's how I'm going to build my kingdom, etc., etc. We're actually told in a variety of different forms, this is the only way that this could have occurred by the sending of the God-man, of a person who was truly, fully, 100% God, deity, right? and truly, fully, totally human, 
human in order that humanity might actually be redeemed, in order that humanity could be saved, in order that the just penalty of God's righteousness and justice that was due unto humanity would indeed still actually be poured out upon humanity. Are you following? But that humanity, keeping in mind as we're told, Christ bore all the sins of his people. He bore all the eternal wrath that was due unto us. And he did it in three hours. Humanity could not have possibly hoped a purely human person could not have possibly hoped to have endured that. It would have been impossible and it would be ridiculous to think that that would occur. Therefore, it is only the eternal deity that was even capable of bearing eternal punishment. It's the eternality, the everlastingness of that wrath that was poured out that determines that it therefore must be an eternal being who is actually capable of bearing that. Especially when we think about wrath being needed to be poured out on humanity. It is humanity that had sinned against God. It is humanity that was due the justice. Therefore, God could not just simply wave a magic wand and just kind of wish it away in an act of proverbial debt forgiveness or in an instance of sweeping it under the rug or just pretending that the demands of perfect, righteous, infinite justice somehow could just be done away with. Instead, humanity had to suffer the consequences. That's why we use those terms substitutionary atonement, right? to describe what occurred on the cross because it was not just simply uh, God doing a nice thing for us or God kind of just doing some proverbial divine magic. No, it actually really was a human being substituted in our place in order that humanity in its nature would take that punishment and fulfilled the demands of justice in doing so. That's why it's important to understand what this verse is telling us. That's why it's important to understand why the reality of the God-man who is the second person of the Trinity is not just a mere intellectual exercise. It is in fact foundational, essential, and fundamental to the very gospel itself. This is why so many battles were fought across the centuries, especially the first 500 of the church, to accurately and biblically define who Christ is. That's why the preponderance of heresies are attacks, not just vaguely on the Trinity, although there are plenty of those. They're not attacks on the infallibility and the inerrancy of scripture, although there are plenty of those, the preponderance of heresies are aimed, their trajectory is against what? Christ. Against particularly the nature of Christ, who Christ is. It's for that reason, because when you undermine who Christ is, when you pervert or change who Jesus is, who the second person is in his nature, in his essence, you destroy the gospel. So that might just be public enemy number one for the kingdom of darkness, would it not? So let me use some explanations of what we're being told here of to how this works in very simple forms. Again, we do, like we do when we discuss the Trinity and various other subjects, we do inevitably run into the wall of our finite mortality. We reach a point where we are incapable of fully comprehending how on earth this actually works, okay? And that's fine. But we can 
understand the premises, especially because it's a lot easier to understand in his nature who Christ isn't versus who he is. You can point very easily to kind of what the proverbial lines or boundaries are of go, okay, it's not that, okay, it's not that, okay, it's not that. Remember the first week we I gave a couple of analogies that are commonly thrown out trying to explain the Trinity. Right, I explained to you the egg analogy and how that falls flat on its face. Uh, I explained the, the, the analogy of H2O of water and how you fall into the heresy of modalism right, and a variety of other things. Right? By legend, I know some of you know this, by legend, St. Patrick, the, the Irish bishop, used a, a shamrock, right, a three-leaf clover, to try and explain. Uh, it's actually not a, not, a, not a terrible attempt, but again, it also fails for a variety of reasons. Right? And so what we're seeing here, if I can boil it down using almost pantomime at this point, fully God, the entire essence of divinity, fully man, the entire essence of humanity, united in one person, but not mixed or intermingled. Do you understand what we're getting at? It is not the case that the humanity of Christ was kind of absorbed into the second person so that it was now almost like mixing in uh, syrup or mixing in things for, for icing and cake, right? So now it's indistinguishable. There are a variety of heresies that attempted to purport that and were shot down, rightfully so. It is also not the case that Jesus is two persons, a divine person and a human person. That's a heresy referred to as Nestorianism from about the fifth century. There's not two persons. There's one person in what's called a hypostatic union or just simply a personal union. Divine nature, deity. Human nature, bodily. United, dwelling in fullness in him, singular, like this. Now, the wall of our finite mortality that I referenced earlier. Where does the divinity of God end and the humanity, so the divinity of Christ end and the humanity of Christ begin? Can't tell you. Can't tell you. Because we're now in that point where we cannot conceptualize something almost like the Trinity that exists beyond space and time itself, that is the union of something that is completely unique. No being, no creature has ever existed in this fashion. He is entirely unique, even among the Trinity. Right? The essence of deity, of godness, of divinity, is fully dwelling in him. That's his divine nature. But yet, at the exact same time, neither the first nor the third person of the Trinity have a body. How? But I thought the full, fullness of deity dwelt again. Pfft, we're back at that point, and that's okay. Two natures, one person. Not two persons. Right, where sometimes you know Jesus is acting as a human, and then now he's acting as a as a god, and he kind of has this bipolar schizophrenic nature to him. He's also not human and divine, and that's now then merged with each other to form one nature. That's a heresy called Apollinarianism. That the humanity and the divinity combine to form one brand new nature that would destroy the essence of the humanity, it would make the cross a waste of time, and the gospel would be destroyed. Because now humanity would not be bearing the punishment. Two natures, one person. Almost in essence the inverse in one sense of what we understand about the Trinity. One nature in three persons. We get into a head spin. But the simplest form of fully God, 
fully man, united or in union in one person. That person is the one who we call Jesus, who we call Jesus Christ, who exists to this day in that personal union, in that hypostatic union. And that is the means by which we are saved. That the God-man who came, right, like as John says in verse 14 of chapter 1, right, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? Interestingly, he's using a different word for dwells there. He's using a synonym that literally means to pitch one's tent, right, or to build a tabernacle. It's kind of a double entendre. John is figuratively referring back to the tabernacle in the Old Testament context, right, where the holiness or the glory of God dwelt in the tabernacle as it was moving nomadically with the people of Israel. Here, in that passage in John 1, he was pointing to the fact that Jesus, in the fact that the Logos, the Word, the eternal God who he explained up in verse 1 and 2, was now in flesh, and that flesh was almost like the tabernacle. Right? It became the tabernacle in which the glory of God now resided, showing that he is the Old Testament God. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells, present tense, bodily, i.e. in the flesh, in humanity. Fully God, fully man, two natures united in one person. That's what occurred at the incarnation, right? By the power of the Holy Spirit, in the womb of the Virgin Mary, two natures, one person. Fully God, fully man, one being, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. That is the fundamentals of Christology in all of about 40 minutes. Amen. <laughs>